Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank Mary Ellen for inviting me to participate in this. Um, I think it's a really valuable session. Um, as you saw, Dr. Petty spoke about Gamma Knife, and Mary Ellen's going to talk about Cyber Knife. And I'll talk about LINAC radius surgery and specifically about one particular LINAC that's a dedicated LINAC radius surgery system. That's the Novalis TX, or at least I'll use it in my examples. And um, I apologize to those who attended the refresher course yesterday morning because some of the slides are similar, naturally. But um, I'll try to mix it up a little bit. And also, it's my intention to scare the hell out of all of you people. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to finish that in the talk. And just to reinforce what I said yesterday and what I say continually, and that is... Um, this is radius surgery, or SBRT, and I'll be talking about both, as I think Mary Ellen will be. And uh, we deliver large doses in um, very um, few fractions, and so our requirements for um, accuracy, precision, QA, diligence, etc., are really a little bit different than conventional radiotherapy. So I just pulled out a few things from the literature. There are quite a few. And I'll point out um, this one from the NRC website. If you ever want to see what people do, at least um, people who have um, radioactive sources, go to the NRC website and do a search, and you'll see that um, if you've made a mistake, you're not the only one. People treat the wrong side of the head, people use the wrong collimator size, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not limited to any particular device or particular error. There are lots of devices and lots of errors, so I blanked out some of the information to protect the um, innocent. Uh, so, um, in general, how do you get started? Well, plan ahead. I get lots of calls from people who say, I've got a machine that's being installed next week. What should I do? And if, um, if, you get those, if you're in that situation or if I get those kind of calls, then you should find somewhere different to work because you've already lost the battle. You need to get involved well in advance before a decision on a machine is made, before you even decide why you want a machine and and what you're going to do with it. So get the team together, coordinate with everybody well in advance, and decide why it is that you're buying a machine. Well, you're buying a machine because you want to do something, some clinical applications with it. Is that radius surgery? If it's radius surgery, what are you going to do with it? Do you want to treat um, METs only, or do you want to treat functional disorders, pain, trigeminal neuralgia? They have different requirements for, um, for what you're going to do. Are you going to do SBRT? And if you're going to do SBRT, what are you going to do? Lung, liver, prostate, spine, they have different requirements. Some of them have motion and some of them don't. And you need to think about all of those things. So um, you assembled your team, you planned ahead, and then um, you decided you're going to go forward in some way, and so you want to get the documentation together. And there's Fortunately, now, lots of documentation. You can start with the ACR Astral Practice Guidelines. They're not very specific in terms of um, your quality assurance, um, but they're specific in, or, or they're general in that um, you should um, have a team. The qualifications of your team should uh, be at a certain level. The responsibilities of the team members should be thus, et cetera. So that's a good place to start. We have task group reports. Um, Sadly, at this time, they're not all in press. There are three relevant ones that I picked out that aren't in press, but below the, the line are all of the ones that are um, in the works. And I've underlined where the word stereotactic or radius surgery appears in those. Those are all relevant task group efforts for SRS and, SR and SBRT programs. And so if they're not in press and you feel that it's important, which it probably is, maybe you can get some guidance from one of the task group chairmen. Um, report 54 is in press, and as I mentioned on um, yesterday morning, that's a bit dated. That was published in 1995, um, and so there are a lot of things that aren't included in there. So you wouldn't want to rely on report number 54 exclusively for your radius surgery program. And I'm going to show you some examples um, from the RTOG, um, particularly for SBRT, RTOG has a wealth of information that's freely available on the RTOG website. So, for example, RTOG 0236, that's the um, initial lung SBRT protocol, um, has a lot of information about defining your anatomy, has a lot of information about this defining dose constraints. Um, so it's got clinical 
information in it. It's got a lot of guidance for physicists, and maybe there are some places where it doesn't say why. So, for example, it says IMRT is not allowed, and you could say or you could ask, well, why isn't IMRT allowed? Um, they don't allow energies more than 10 MV, although there's one little exception up to 15 MV. And you might ask, well, why is that? Um, they don't allow field sizes less than 3.5 centimeters in diameter. So there are good physical reasons for all of these. Um, and if you read this document and ask some questions and read other documents, you fi figure out why that is, and it helps you in, in implementing your program. So I, I love RTOG. Um, 0236 and the subsequent documents. Um, and there are some other things, um, but there's a lot of information in the literature, as you saw in Dr. Petty's talk. So get this all together in advance so that you're prepared and um, you're not making a phone call um, because your machine's being installed next week. Um, you know, along with your clinical goals, you want to determine what kind of equipment you need and what kind of techniques you need to best facilitate your clinical goals. You're going to do IMRT, you're going to do dynamic ARCs, robotic delivery, um, ARC IMRT delivery, et cetera. So that goes into the decision process. Um, and then all of those um, um, ancillary um, delivery issues. How are you going to simulate the patients? If it's SBRT, how are you going to manage motion and immobilize? What are you going to do for localization? Are you going to do frameless? Are you going to do frame-based, and how are you going to do verification that your patient's in the right spot? So you got um, all the proper resources together before you even make a decision. So that's the personnel. Um, I put time here as a resource. It's a critical resource for physicists. And so if you're the only physicist, I'll probably say this several times, if you're the only physicist at an already busy place and your administrator says, we're just buying such and such machine for SRS and SBRT, um, then you're prepared to tell them what's involved um, in getting that machine ready. So you can't do it in two weeks. You can't do it in a month. Um, but if you plan ahead, you know what it takes and you know the proper response. Um, what equipment that you're going to need to go along with that. So the machine by itself isn't enough. You need special dosimetry equipment, as, as you've seen and, and as you will see. Um, you need special patient devices, immobilization devices, etc. And then as you assemble your team, you want to clearly clarify the procedures and the responsibilities of the team members, design a QA program with each of those in mind. And remember, of course, as we all know, as a physicist, you're going to be responsible for all the technical details. And particularly if mistakes happen, you'll be responsible. So let's look at our example. This is an Ovalis TX. Some of you may be familiar with this. If you're not, I'll go through it um, briefly, and you should be intimidated by this um, within the next 30 seconds or so. So this is a dual-energy LINAC um, with an additional photon mode that's a high-dose rate mode. We'll call it SRS mode, and it has multiple electron energies. Um, nothing all that special except for the high-dose high rate mode so far. It's got a new MLC that you may not be familiar with. That's the HD120. It's got some leaves that are two and a half millimeters and some that are five. So there's a new MLC you probably haven't seen. It's got electronic portal imaging. You're probably familiar with that. You may or may not be familiar with OBI and cone beam CT, but it has those capabilities. In the room, it's got a room-mounted stereoscopic imaging system for localization and verification. Um, it's got a real-time stereoscopic infrared imaging system for real-time monitoring, and it's got a robotic couch. And so um, this is going to be installed next week, and they want to use it um, on the first patient two weeks from that point. So um, you want to be adequately prepared. Then you have some uh, accessories. You've got frames, either single fraction or um, the mask for SRT. You've got localizer boxes, target positioning boxes, couch mounts, uh, a number of circular collimators, which, by the way, you'll measure the beam data for those, the collimator mount, and the Winston Lutz tool. So all of that's coming with your Novalis TX. You, you probably have a new planning system, which is iPlan, a very nice planning system, but you're probably not familiar with it, and it has a lot of capabilities, such as supporting circular collimator delivery, and you may use that 
in um, one case, uh, and in a few cases, but in one case for trigeminal neuralgia, for example. So very high dose, need to be very precise. The system's capable of it, but the question is, will you be? Um, conformal beams, of course, with the HD120 MLC. And one of the things you might treat with that um, in cranial applications are AVMs. So are you ready to treat AVMs? You need to do radiographic localization. You get to talk with your radiology department about how you how this is done, how you acquire the images, how you import them and localize them, etc. Uh, you're going to do SBRT. Of course, that's supported in a variety of ways, either with um, fixed beams or dynamic conformal arcs. The system is capable of gated radiotherapy. It's a very nice IMRT planning and delivery system. And dynamic arcs, which you may or may not be familiar with, is a nice conformal technique where the leaves move continuously while the gantry rotates. It's not um, IMAT or rapid arc, but it's a very nice conformal technique. So all of these things are supported by the planning system and um, possible on the Novalis TX. Okay, so um, let's say that for the sake of the example, you've made that decision, you're going to go forward, and you've uh, allotted enough time and resources to do it. Um, so you get ready to do some of the physics work. Um, for photons on a Novalis TX, there's really seven sets of beam data that you can take. So you have circular collimators, and um, that's the, the algorithm for doing the calculation is here. So circular collimators have one particular algorithm. X low and X high, uh, the two X low modes, the standard, which goes to 40 by 40, or the high dose rate mode, which goes to 15 by 15, maximum field size, and X high in the standard 40 by 40 mode, all can be um, commissioned using for a pencil beam algorithm. In addition, the MLC modes can also be commissioned for a Monte Carlo algorithm. And if you're going to do SBRTs, particularly for lung, then you should be commissioning that, um, those beams and those algorithms. Um, just as part of the documentation in this example, um, as soon as you know what device you're getting and you've started planning for it, get the doc documentation on this device. So here's a wonderful 250-page um, physics document that comes from the manufacturer. And as you go through this, there's wonderful information. And if you learn it all, you'll know what to do and you won't make any mistakes. Um, but that will be a long weekend reading. Um, it doesn't just tell you what to do and how to do it. It recommends some equipment. So again, here's a document that um, helps you decide what dosimetry and other equipment that you need in order to um, implement this program. Uh, just a little bit about physics, and some of this is repetition from, from Tuesday. Um, you have very small beams. You have a four millimeter circular collimator. You have a five by five millimeter square field made out of, made with the MLCs. So you need small detectors. Pinpoint um, uh, small ionization chambers are, are good down to about 15 or 20 millimeters in my experience. And below that you should consider using a diode because it has a smaller um, sensitive area and volume. If you commission the Monte Carlo algorithm, then you'll need to do some scans in air. And if you need to do scans in air, then you'll need to get a buildup cap. Um, several of the companies will sell you a buildup cap for your small pinpoint type chambers. Um, just some words about diodes and radiographic film um, while we're here. They're both energy dependent, so you need to be very careful with those. I don't recommend that you use radiographic film at all for small fields. Um, due to the um, changes in the energy spectrum with field size. Uh, as Dr. Petty pointed out, um, you can use gaff chromic film very successfully, so that's, um, that's one option. If you decide to use diodes, um, rec recognize that they're also energy dependent um, and um, that the response will drift a little bit over time. So to address the energy dependence in diodes, what I recommend is um, that you use an intermediate field size. So let's say it's maybe 20 millimeters on your Novalis TX. And take your field reading, maybe it's the 5 millimeter output factor, relative to the 20 millimeter intermediate size. So there's little energy spectral spectrum changes in those two field sizes. You can do that with a diode. 
and then repeat the 20 millimeter size with an ion chamber relative to your reference of 10 by 10. Um, I'll show you some examples of data, some good data, some bad data. I'll point out which data is bad if it's not obvious. Um, the um, output factor falls off quickly as a function of field size. So if uh, 10 by 10 is defined as 1, and you, when you get down to um, a 4 millimeter diameter in this case, you're somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.65 or so. And here are just some um, examples. These were original Novalis machines. These are um, uh, the new Novalis TX. And they're surprisingly similar across machines if it's measured properly. And even the old Novalis um, really resembles fairly closely the new Novalis TX. So once you measure me these, recognizing that the measurement's challenging, you can always call your friend down the street and say, hey, what did you get? Um, and that's a great way to um, help to minimize some of your errors. Uh, the same thing with the HD120. There's a lot of numbers here, I apologize. I'll just point out one of them or two of them. For the smallest fields down in here, these are two different institutions. This one was 0 0.58 and 0.63. This is 0 0.59 and 0 0.62. Again, the machines are remarkably similar from machine to machine. That's the point I want to try to make. Um, so as you collect your data, um, see if you can find some other data to compare to. And just some uh, graphs. This happens to be the um, HD120. Percent depth dose as a function of field size. If you haven't done this before, what, what you may notice, and which is um, a, a real phenomenon, is that as you go s smaller and smaller in field size, um, you may see a shift of Dmax towards the surface a little bit. So if your nominal Dmax is 1.5, for a 5 millimeter field, you may see a Dmax of 1.2 or so. And here's some just some percent depth dose data for two different institutions in the line and in the um, data points. As a function of field, I'll just go through this as a function of field size. And again, the percent depth dose data, if measured um, well, should agree um, well from machine to machine and institution to institution. Um, just a figure of off-axis profiles. This is for circular collimators. You'll make these measurements. And then for, um, for your MLC fields, what you need to do on this particular machine is not measure transverse profiles, but diagonal profiles. And you need full, f full field size, 40 by 40, diagonal field sizes, di sorry, diagonal scans at seven dip different depths going down to 35 centimeters. None of us have a water tank that's big enough to do that. So what I recommend is... Um, shifting your water tank off-center relative to the central axis, rotating your collimator 45 degrees, and taking half scans. And so what this graph is uh, is the half diagonal scan from here to here is from here to here. And still you can see that they get cut off over there on the edge. But this is fine. It's more than adequate for the beam modeling that then takes place. So beam modeling um, for this particular machine and planning system um, you take these profiles, these diagonal or radial profiles, and you send them to the vendor, and the vendor does some fitting on them. And what you get back are um, what the vendor calls um, radial factors, and it's really the first derivative of these radial profiles. And this is the data that gets put into your planning system, not the direct measurement. So um, in this sense, you have to trust the vendor a little bit, but you're not going to completely trust them because you're going to commission your treatment planning system and make sure that it works. Um, know what your vendor is, is doing and what they're not doing with any data that they may manipulate. Um, so going back to output factors in Dr. Petty's last or second to last slide, she made the comment, output factors are challenging, mo the most challenging measurement, and that's true of, of any device. This is just to show you that um, for this happened to be a 6 by 6 millimeter MLC field size. These are the output factors that various institutions got. There's a lot of spread in those. And um, you see two institutions in particular had a big challenge in doing that. So this, this measurement that this institution used, put in their planning system and, and treated patients with, is off by a factor of 10. Um, they used the wrong dosimeter. They didn't have... A small dosimeter, they had a 0.6 cc farmer chamber, 
which clearly wasn't adequate. And uh, and if they would have gone into the room and looked at the field light projecting on that, they may have known that. Um, that wasn't in this country. That was in France. It got a lot of publicity. But I got this set of data um, a month ago, and, P and the center asked me to look at these output factors and tell me, tell them if I thought they were correct or not. And I looked at them, and I immediately knew that they were grossly in error. Um, they had some remeasured data, and those looked much, um, much better. But if they had used this for trigeminal neuralgia, let's say, and delivered a dose, or pre prescribed a dose of 80 gray, they would have delivered a dose more like 160 gray. So those are um, severe consequences. Just a couple more challenges people in the, this country have had. These are different in institutions than the others I showed you. So some funny-looking depth dose curves. Um, another funny-looking depth dose curve in green. And so those all introduced some errors into the process. So um, let's say that you've prepared in advance, got the right equipment, made the right measurements, and verified that with your colleague that th those look like good data. Put it into your planning system. Start commissioning it. Start with some simple examples, um, single beams. Um, go to some more sophisticated configuration, like maybe one arc. So what I'll show you in this slide and the next are the film dosimetry. This is um, EDR film in color wash and the dose calculation in solid line. Um, it's, it's actually true. I didn't just draw it on there. It, look, it can look that good in a solid water phantom. Here are some that show you a little bit more um, variation. The green areas show you where the gamma exceeded my 3 millimeters or 3% criteria. But again, I'm going starting kind of simple. One circular arc, then two isocenters with several circular arcs in different configurations, a four-field box, um, dynamic and formal arcs. This, this is actually five um, separate arcs and five different table angles, and IMRT. And go through this and go through a series more of these, and um, hopefully you get agreement that's acceptable to you and you feel everything's working correctly. Of course, that's our, that's our relative distributions. You want to compare your absolute dosimetry as well. And so you'll repeat that for... Um, some absolute measurements that you might make. Here's my solid water phantom. Simple one. You can put TLDs or ion chambers in. Um, I do have a Lucy phantom. I'm one of those lucky ones Dr. Petty alluded to. You can make similar measurements in the Lucy phantom. Be aware that this is not water equivalent, so go back to TG21 and look up the material in TG1 and make the appropriate correction when you make the measurements in this plastic phantom. Um, so that's some absolute measurements. Here's some relative measurements with a GAF or EBT film that you might put in there, depending, uh, sorry, GAF or EDR, depending on the dose that you're going to deliver. And just another one. So those are kind of end-to-end -end, uh, tests. Um, from a mechanical point of view, uh, the Winston-Lutz test that I think you've all heard of by now is really the, the, the test that we use to assess isocentric isocentricity on our machine, put a ball at the isocenter, take some film shots as a function of gantry, couch, collimator angle, and assess those. Um, and um, over a wide range, or let's say the full range of those um, angles, you should be able to get an average that's on the order of half a millimeter or so, plus or minus. If your vendor comes in and says, yeah, but the spec is 0.75, then you should tell the vendor, yeah, but I think you can do better. And repeat that for cones and for MLC because they, the, their central axis is independent from one another. Here's some end-to-end uh, -end evaluations that I've used with this particular phantom. I'm just going to speed up a little bit. I like that phantom. It's uh, manufactured to a high tolerance by the manufacturer. Um, and all of the objects inside there have a known volume and uh, location in stereotactic coordinate space. That happens to be the BRW space for radionics or brain lab. And so, oh, I thought I had that circled. So, for example, I can put my mouse on the tip of the cone and ask the planning system, where do you think the tip of the cone is? And it says it's here at these coordinates, and I know the manufacturer manufactured them to be at these coordinates, and I can tell um, quickly if this planning system algorithms are working correctly or not. Um, that's critical because, of course, what you're going to be doing on patients is um, identifying an isocenter on a CT scan 
and trying to replicate that in the treatment room in some kind of process like this. So first of all, this part needs to work well. And then there's several other steps that involve printing out some templates. And of course, your lasers need to be accurate, etc. So how do you know this part works? Well, I like that phantom again for a second reason. I still get to go to here, right? Yeah. Yep, okay. But I am speeding up. I haven't used all my time yet, but it's getting close. Um, contour the objects. This is an uh, put some beams on there, so an anterior beam, a lateral beam. Ask the system to automatically shape the MLCs to um, those objects, those, that PTV that I made. Transfer it to my record and verify system, mode up on my, my machine. Position the phantom the way I would position a patient with the lasers. Project the light field over those and see does the shape project uh, properly on those objects. Similarly, I could put an isocenter on the tip of the cone and ask, does the la do the lasers project on the tip of the cone? So that's a nice end-to-end -end test. You can use the phantom for image fusion, and you can use the Lucy phantom for image fusion as well. Um, hidden target test, again, f to s put, it in, put an object, uh, a phantom in a frame, scan it, plan it, set it up, and assess. Um, both the um, RPC and the Lucy Phantom have hidden targets that you can take into your treatment room in uh, this kind of way. Set it up, um, put a circular collimator or a small square, uh, square field, and see can you really hit that hidden target that's inside there. Um, and in that regard, I'm going to move on a little bit to um, SBRT. Um, I encourage you to use all of the RPC phantoms, depending on what your applications will be. These aren't just for clinical trials. You should use these as um, further validation that everything is working well. So you have the lung, the prostate, the head and neck, RPC phantoms. Okay, so with SBRT, some of our issues are immobilization and mo motion management. Um, you may use compression, like we do at UT Southwestern. Here's the electosteroteactic body frame and CIVCOs. Um, the reason that we use compression is illustrated here in these movies because we can really minimize respiratory motion in a very simple way by properly compressing. And then that makes things a bit easier for us. Then we go on to um, do a 4D CT of the patient. How do you use it? Well, you take a 4D CT, we make a maximum intensity projection, a MIP, from that, we create our ITV and make our PTV. And then for our dose calculation, we use an average image. But one thing you should ask yourself in doing this process is, how do you know the MIP is correct? How do you know the average image is correct? The vendor's calculating that for you on your CT scanner. So you should identify some way to assess that. Are you going to do frame-based or image-based um, localization? Um, these days, with image guidance, you should never use a frame alone. Are you going to do um, use anatomy, or are you going to use markers to set up your patient? Um, it all depends on the application. If you have nice bony anatomy, it works well. If you have soft tissue, um, you may need to um, put in some markers. Use lots of redundancy, so have some positioning forms that get you close to begin with so you're never making big shifts. And again, going back to the Novalis TX, here's the localization with the stereo x-rays. Like a cyber knife, you take two live images in the room, compare those to the DRRs, fuse those together, and then make some shifts accordingly. And you need to make sure that's working properly. Um, that works well in spine, and now we'll see how it works properly. Put a hidden target in a phantom. S um, scan it, plan it, set it up in the room and evaluate. So I, you can tell I love hidden target tests. Um, and here's the results of 50 trials. So image-guided localization works well, but don't just assume that. Test it for yourself. You can do the same thing if you're going to use um, cone beam localization. So you know, all know how that works by now. And again, put a phantom in with a hidden target and see how well you can hit that hidden target. Um, just a couple of examples of how we use cone beam CT for localizing our lung tumor patients. And here's, um, there we can set up on the soft tissue because we can see it. For our prostate patients, we put in gold seeds because we can't really see the prostate on cone beam CT. And then we shift accordingly to the, the gold seeds. 
Um, and let's skip through those. You can do the same thing with the exact track system if you have implanted markers. And let me just go to, I promise I'd start with a warning and end with a warning. So in addition to all of that stuff, know everything your planning system does and know what it takes to make a good plan. That's not a trivial thing, making a good plan and differentiating good for bad. So in SBRT like SRS, use lots of beams. What happens if you don't use lots of beams? If you use too few beams, then you concentrate the dose at areas that you don't want to. And this is particularly exacerbated here because of the buildup phenomena on the couch. So um, my last horror slide is the very first clinical pu publication on SBRT in 1995 from the Swedish group, they reported on 11 patients with liver tumors. And in those 11 liver patients, if you go back and look at it, they actually had three treatment-related deaths. So in addition to all the physics and all the practical issues, you better know what your dose is. Um, I think these will be online. I just finished with the ACR recommendations. This leaves little room for error in the overall process. And I will finish with this slide and let Mary Ellen introduce uh, herself. herself. <laughs> Thank you.